Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure a lot of you have already heard some about this bill, and this is really the, the week where we, you know, the make it or break it week for this bill. So thank you for joining. So what we're gonna do today, Delaney, if you don't mind going to the next slide, thank you, is first we're gonna talk about what is actually, um, and then the next slide, what's actually in the bill, what does this bill actually do? And then why are we passing this bill? Um, and Elizabeth is gonna talk to us about Michael Marshall, um, who really, uh, you know, we should keep in mind as we're working to help pass this bill. And then how do we pass this bill? Whose votes do we really need to help make sure that this bill becomes law? And then we're gonna take action. So if you can start by just dropping in the chat your name and where you live, because you'll be going into breakout rooms based on your county and your legislator. So this is a great time to kind of see what, uh, what parts of Colorado are represented here. So I'm gonna hand it over to Rebecca Wallace, our senior um, staff attorney and senior policy counsel, who's gonna tell us a little bit about what this bill actually does and um, why we really need your help to pass it. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Um, I'm Rebecca and I'm really grateful that you all are here. We are um, just deep, deep, deep in this bill and in need of reinforcements and we're just grateful for you. Um, I'm going to take a, just a few minutes and review the basics of the bill. Can I share my screen? Delena? Um, so I'll just start and see yeah, if I get I'll to share. I'll go ahead and give you screen sharing privileges. Just give me one Thanks. second. Uh, so SB 2162 is a bill to help safely bring more of our neighbors home. And um, this bill seeks to decrease arrests, to decrease the use of cash bond, and to decrease um, jail population. And it does so in a really thoughtful way that has been, you know, stakeholded for over nine months. And uh, does it go as far as the ACLU and some of our uh, other proponents would like? No, but it is a really solid protective harm reduction bill. And um, I'm gonna share now um, the amazing community-led resource. Do I have the right page up? You do. Great, the community-led resource. This is not an ACLU resource. This is a grassroots activist resource on this bill that hopefully someone can drop in the chat the link if you haven't seen it, but I bet many of you, if not all of you have. And, um, it is a really excellent resource for all things about past, about SB 2162. So let me review um, briefly, I'm going to the FAQs. There's a lot of misinformation about this bill and um, I wanna tell you, what does it do? So it seeks to safely reduce jail populations in two primary ways. Um, one is decreasing arrests. How does it do that? By increasing the use of summons or tickets. Um, especially for low level and nonviolent offenses. Although we don't stop there, but that's what are the meat of the bill is a mandatory uh, ticket instead of arrest for uh, municipal offenses and uh, nonviolent misdemeanors. So ones that aren't part of the Victim Rights Act. And that is the, when you think of that, you, you can think of the types of offenses that um, Michael Marshall was picked up for and died in the jail for. You can think about uh, the types of offense that Eric Gardner allegedly committed and died for. You can think about the type of offense that Reverend Marvin Booker uh, was picked up for and died for. And you know, it really is those people and their families that we are, we are working um, in their name and with them to uh, try to pass this bill. And we know that those, uh, those interactions, that moment where an officer can, t can arrest somebody over a low level offense, that is a flashpoint for violence. We are seeing that over and over again. And of course, I should mention, I'm sorry, I just realized in the paper, I'm sure all of you have seen Karen Garner in Loveland, the 73 year old woman with dementia who was wrestled down to the ground and had her arm broken over walking out of a store with $14 worth of goods that she hadn't paid for. 
Um, we want police officers to stop laying their hands on our community members for these low level offenses that do not put the public, public at risk and that do uh, lead to death and unnecessary violence. So that's the meat of the bill. The second, there's also other provisions that are going to encourage officers to think before arresting. And that is for misdemeanor victim crimes and some low level felonies. Um, for those offenses, we want officers to ask themselves, is this person gonna harm somebody else? Do we think they're gonna harm someone else? Are we concerned that they're gonna keep doing this offense? And if they're not worried about those two things, to um, let that person remain free pretrial. You know, remember that this is all about people who have been alleged to have committed a crime. These are not people who've been convicted. Anyone who's been convicted, that is the opportunity and moment for punishment. And the idea here is to, that jail beds, if they're used at all, should only be used for people who pose a risk of harm to others. And that's what this bill gets at. Um, so on the low level felony piece, one thing I wanna point out since it's a point of contention and we'll probably be talking about it more in your breakout group is um, you know, many people think George Floyd was died for an alleged um, low level offense. And uh, because he just, he passed a $20 counterfeit bill or that's the allegation. That in Colorado as um, Elizabeth Epps educated me on is a class five felony. And that is we've faced decades of felonization in this state and across the country where we have increasingly increased the penalties for um, conduct that often is not a, the, a high level of harm. And that kind of um, conduct is represented across these low level felonies. To the extent that there are other um, potentially more serious crimes, officers can always arrest whenever there's a safety risk or a risk of reoffense. This bill does not affect high level violent, it does affect violent felonies, high level uh, violent crimes, statutory crimes of violence, domestic violence, they're not in the bill. And as amended, it also doesn't impact auto theft. The other provision that is actually less controversial and I'm gonna move more quickly through it is a great cash bond provision, reducing cash bond in this state. Um, and that, that basically what it says is, once somebody is in custody pretrial, if a judge is going to set money bond on them, which of course means that somebody without means may be stuck in jail while somebody else can pay, at minimum, the judge must find that the person is either a risk to someone else or a risk of flight. Why those two things? Because those are the two constitutionally uh, justifiable reasons to um, hold somebody pretrial. And um, this has been a provision that we've had, you know, reasonably good buy-in from, you know, across a reasonably good buy-in from. I'm not gonna go through the other details in the bill because I don't think they're gonna be essential for today. And those really are the primary pieces. Um, the only other thing I'll mention is, uh, I just wanna make sure I've covered what the bill doesn't do. Um, it doesn't affect violent felonies, murder, rape, you know, even though a lot, there's a lot of misinformation from local police who do not wanna see their discretion taken away. Um, it does, it uh, uh, does not prohibit arrest for victim rights act offenses. Whenever there's a concern about safety, arrest is always allowed. It has no impact on domestic violence. Um, there's no mandatory personal recognizance bonds. It just requires courts to basically think and make required findings before they're setting a monetary bond. Um, and I think I'm gonna wind up there on the overview of the bill and I'll stop sharing. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for going over that. And what we'll be having um, you all do today is you're going to be writing to your legislator about why you support this bill. And um, the overview is more technical, you know, like fewer cash bonds, more summons instead of arresting everybody all the time. But the real goal is to roll back the real harms on our community of, inc of mass incarceration. And so I wanna hand it over to Elizabeth who um, really is so good at inspiring and reminding us all that, that you know, that's what really matters with this bill. So I'm gonna hand it over to Elizabeth. Okay, well, that was a stressful intro, but, um, but I love Helen, so she can get away with almost anything in my book. Um, I'm Elizabeth Epps. I'm an abolitionist. I co-direct with, I think I saw my co-director on here, Eva Frickle. 
um, we co-direct the Colorado Freedom Fund. And our job at the Colorado Freedom Fund is to work to bring our neighbors home. And we are working to work ourselves out of existence. Um, this is not my dream job. I do not dream of labor. Um, and so this is a bill that is going to help us work ourselves out of existence. I want to speak briefly to you about the bill, um, but also about Michael Marshall. And I'm going to do it without crying. Uh, SB 62 is not a hypothetical thing for us, y'all. There's a national bill right now called the George, George Floyd Policing Act. Thoughtful people have issues with that bill for multiple reasons, but at its core, there isn't a single provision in it that had the provision been in place would have saved his life. That doesn't mean it's not supportable, but I'm just really sensitive to the fact that it wouldn't have saved his life. Michael Marshall was arrested and alleged to have trespassed. He was... Um, I'm not gonna cry, he's a very sweet man who we've gotten to know through his family. He was held on a $100 bond. So the work that we do at the Freedom Fund and, at the, and that the ACLU does related to 62 is about Michael Marshall, right? Um, we don't have to go to Minnesota or to other states to think about people who should drive our work. Michael Marshall should here. I want you to know specifically that every element of the things that happened to him as law enforcement killed him, we are working to undo each stage of that. Right. So one thing that held him is he was held on a hundred dollars bond. A couple of years ago, you helped us pass a bill that ensured that money bond couldn't hold him on this offense, that he would get a PR bond. So that was a big step. But now we're working to make it that people with guns can't drag this man to a cage, period, over allegedly this tiny offense. And that's what 62 is going to ensure. Um, won't happen, right? So it's a big deal, right, to not hold him on bond, but it's a much bigger deal to say you can't take him to the cage in the first place. Hope you understand that that's teeing it up for it next year and in the year after, we're going to move into a society, right, where when, a, when one of our neighbors is having a crisis, we bring someone who has loving arms and not a gun and helps him in his situation so there's no police contact, period. That's what we're moving to, and that's what 62 helps us do. Um, when, when folks are killed by police, I feel very strongly that their families don't owe us, don't owe us anything, sorry, uh, don't owe us anything. But his family has for years, and I'm tired of black folks having to be strong, but for years have been gracious and resilient and have done this work um, in his name and have let us lift up his story. So that's a bit about him. Uh, every time we talk to his niece, Natalia, we learn more about him. And um, we are all certain that he would be delighted and tickled at the work that she is doing um, in his name. By all accounts, he was kind and hilarious uh, and loving, and he deserves so much better. So we do this for him. And I'm really committed, and I know that Rebecca and Helen and this team and you all are going to be committed that we don't treat dead neighbors as rhetorical devices, okay? We don't talk about them as political points or as bargaining chips or as really just as rhetorical devices, their lives matter. And if we're not going to do work that amplifies their story and that prevents what happened to them from happening, then we really have no business having their names in our mouths. Um, and so when we say we do this for Michael, we, we mean it. And SB 62 uh, would, uh, Rebecca used the phrase better than I did. Um, how did you say it, Rebecca, about basically taking away that moment where there's an escalation, right? When a person with a gun is putting someone in handcuffs, that's by necessity an escalating moment. And this takes that away. Um, Helen, can I add one other thing about the bill? Oh, yeah, of course. You're so uh, I love this picture of him so much. Um, I want to mention two other things, actually, uh, about Karen Garner and Loveland. There's something significant, y'all, right, about a 73-year-old precious a woman half my size that they'll do this to her and they'll laugh about it. We can't legislate their feelings. You know, I don't believe we can constrain empathy into people. But what we can do is say, from here on out in Colorado, if someone allegedly walks out of Walmart, insert lecture on who's the real thief in this scenario, Walmart or the poor woman. But when this happens, what we're not gonna let you do is put handcuffs on our neighbor over $13.88. And we crafted this bill before we ever knew her name, right? And luckily we know her name in the context of her being alive, but her life has been just devastated by this. So we do it for her. 
I want to say about the bill itself, y'all, as you're moving into advocacy, and I'm so excited to see, it's weird, like I look at you and of course you're individuals, but I look and I immediately think, okay, Greeley, um, love, like I recognize where you live and who your senators are. Um, in my mind, when it comes to the Democrats, and there's, there's 20 of them in the Senate, in my mind, Rebecca's a policy guru, but to me, there's like three categories of them on this bill. There are Democrats, shout out to those of you who your senator is Chris Colker or Julie Gonzalez, who are, and others, but those are the two that come to mind. There's a group one, they're gonna vote for this bill because they were in from jump, they read it, they get it, they understand, they're gonna vote for it and stand by it because they want to. There's kind of a second group who are gonna vote for it, but they needed the amendment to make them feel more comfortable. Um, they're not as comfortable, but they're gonna do it anyway, and they want to be supported. And then there's this third group who, cut me off if I'm saying too much, who aren't going to vote yes until and unless we make them, but we can make them. They'd probably rather us not vote on the bill at all, but they will vote yes when you make them. So whether you're um, in a one, two, or three, or whether you're in a group where your senator um, is not a Democrat and you're laying the ground for the yes vote next year and to, to beat them next year, all of that works matters. So thank you for being here. Thank you for me. Um, and thank you for Michael Marshall's family. Um, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I, you definitely lived up to the inspirational, the, the intro where I called you inspirational. Um, so now we're, I'm going to hand it back over to Rebecca, who's going to talk about now that we know what the bill is and why it's so important to pass, um, where, where the bill is in the process of being passed and which legislators we really need you to contact today. And then we're going to move over into the breakout rooms. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. And thanks, Elizabeth. So, um, we are very, unfortunately, still quite early in the stage of this bill becoming a law. Um, it has already been introduced in the Senate, and in order for it to become a law, it has to pass out of the Senate and then pass out of the House and then be signed by the governor. Um, in the Senate, it has gone to um, the first committee, which is like a small, it's the Senate Judiciary Committee, and that's the first step for bills after introduction that they have to pass out of sort of like a small um, subcommittee that is usually related to the subject matter of the bill. It did pass out on party lines, um, and now it is waiting to go to Senate appropriations, which is where it, it, it has a relatively small fiscal note, meaning a cost to the state. And so it has to pass through the appropriations committee next, and then it has to pass two votes on the Senate floor and win a majority of votes. Um, and we do believe the Senate is critical uh, the this is uh, we often have bipartisan bills. This is one that may have some bipartisan support, but it would only be one or two if we are lucky. So we are really counting on Democrats in this. And there is a very small minority. I mean, a small majority in the Senate. So there's not a lot of wiggle room. And we already have at least one no vote among the Democrats. So we every vote is going to really count here. Um, and we probably won't get even in the Judiciary Committee, we were supposed to be there this Friday, we are not, and it may be because we need to get all of our votes lined up. And um, this bill is a highly controversial bill. Most people see it as the most controversial bill of the session. And it really does, unfortunately, what we see is sort of cops lined up on one side, local cops, and community on the other. Um, what's maybe a bit unusual that I should have mentioned previously is that this is a bill that also has reform-minded public safety support, law enforcement support. Um, so although we're we are not currently able to count on local police to reform themselves or limit their discretion in any way, we do have the Attorney General of Colorado, the Colorado Department of Public Safety, several reform-minded elected district attorneys and, and, and a sheriff down in La Plata County all supporting this bill. Um, and it, and in strong support. And we also have a uh, survivors group in support of this bill, many crime survivors, individual crime survivors in support of this bill, and we don't have any victim group op opposition. And that really says something about how this bill is situated. It's like community reform and reform-minded public safety, and then lo you know local police um, opposing it. And it's, it's a struggle. Can we go to the next slide? 
um, who are we contacting today? So we are contacting our key senators who Can you go back, have, Elena? Sorry. Who have not yet committed to voting for the bill. I'm just gonna say right here that probably the Senator who will make or break this bill is Senator Rhonda Fields in Aurora, who is on the fence and she understands it's community on one side and police on the other. Um, and she really needs individualized reach out from people who care. Um, I think it might especially, you know, and, and who also understand that she has a complicated relationship with the police. Um, and uh, has needed them for has needed them in her life, but also has understood the ways in which um, they have harmed, especially in Aurora and community, communities of color in Aurora. Um, but so she is key to individualized outreach. Um, we think that Senator Bridges um, and Senator Winter are uh, leaning yes and need some additional support to know that the community has their back when they are taking a, um, what they may view as a tough vote because they are voting against local police who have basically infiltrated their city council. Um, and we need to remind them that community has their back and that their constituents are not just police and, um, and city councils, that their constituents are all these people who elected them and were electing them for change. Um, and then we have Chris Hansen, who I actually, he's on appropriations and uh, he, I think he, he's, he has an indicated to his supporters actually that he's a yes. I think that he continues to struggle some with some of the, um, the lower level felonies that are in the bill. And I, and I think you can talk, we can talk about it more in the breakout room or even here if I have time about why there is so important to leave in and why there's plenty of public safety protection already built in. But I think we talked already about George Floyd and with so many people with George Floyd's name in their mouth saying, we need to do something um, to pass a bill that leaves, that leaves him out um, just seems immoral and tone deaf to this moment. Um, so, and then Joanne Janal, um, she, was a yes, and her district attorney is in support. Um, but over the course of the last month, with the pressure and frankly, lies and misinformation spread by local law enforcement, she has moved to something else. I don't, I, I don't know if it's leaning no, but it certainly doesn't feel like it's leaning yes. Um, and she um, she really does have like incredible support because she can rely on a DA who is, you know, in support. And there's been some amazing community activists who have been um, working to pressure her to support. Um, but, uh, and Rachel Zenzinger, I think we're going to take off this list, frankly. Um, I think she's a confirmed no. And I'm not sure that we, I think we are thinking that is not worth the time of the folks here. Um, and then the last key piece for folks who do not, who aren't constituents for any of the people here that we've listed. Um, there is a opportunity to reach out to Senate leadership. This is really critical. So um, Senator Stephen Fenberg is the Senate um, majority leader and Senator Leroy Garcia is the president. They are the standard bearers for Democrats in the Senate. How they vote, how they advocate for this bill um, has so much to set the tone for how, whether others will follow. Whether they are um, committed to holding the line on this bill, not having further amendments that will do damage to it is going to set a strong tone for the rest of the caucus. And I'll just say there is a lot of, um, pressure to make this bill just go away. Um, for people who uh, this, there are many people who would like to avoid taking what they view as a hard vote and, um, and just have it die. So that, that is something that Senate leadership can help make happen or stop from happening. They control the calendar, they control when it goes into appropriations, they control when it goes onto the Senate floor, 
and their feeling that they are accountable to um, to all of you and other constituents are the very types of things that can make this bill actually move and it needs to move soon. So I think that's the overview. Great. So um, now you all have heard about the bill and what we really need. So what we're going to do now is soon we'll ask you to move into breakout rooms based on where you live. So if you live in Larimer or know that you're Senator Joanne Janal's constituent, you're gonna go to the breakout room that says Larimer. If you live in, um, please don't leave quite yet. Um, so if you live in Adams, then you're, well, um, if you live in Adams, then you're gonna move into the Adams district and that is to contact Senator Winter um, we are not going to be going into Jefferson. No one go into the Jefferson breakout room. Zenzinger is a firm no uh, outside of this, you know, um, and we just don't think it's productive to have people contacting her. If you live in Pueblo, you'll be contacting Senator Garcia. And for anyone who really wants to help us with Senate leadership, we have a phone bank tomorrow at 4 p.m. where we'll be calling ACLU supporters in Pueblo to ask them to contact their senator. The RSVP link will be in the chat. If you live in Arapahoe and your senators are Bridges or uh, Fields, Senator Fields, then you'll be in Arapahoe and contacting them. For folks in Denver, you're going to be asked to contact Senate leadership and Denver local officials like city council. And if you live anywhere else, so if you live in Boulder, if you live anywhere else, you're gonna be contacting Senate leadership. And what we're going to have you do in the breakout room is write a personalized email and make a phone call. And I know many of you probably already filled out form emails, but as you'll hear from your breakout leader, it is the personalized, thoughtful emails that have really been swaying legislators and where we've actually heard what legislators' concerns are. So it really matters. So we have half an hour to, um, to really work 